Let's start. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, we've, uh, we're in the middle still of a chapter on, uh, pos- on the positive cone, and uh, today I want to start a series of um, units on dilation theory. So, So for the simplest case, we actually already did that in some form, namely by showing that every channel can be written in a cross representation. Uh, so this, this will actually be uh, later come out as a corollary of the science bridge dilation. And that's, these are very basic constructions that are need, needed all over the place. So I'll start with a very small step. make a Hilbert space. So this, this will actually be the basic, basic construction by which we build up uh, certain spaces uh, that allow us for, uh, uh, that give us a simpler representation of the objects we are interested in. And uh, the basic object here is uh, just x would be a set. And we have a function, call it k, that takes pairs of uh, points in x and assigns to each such, such pair a complex number. And this is called a positive kernel. choice, we can build a matrix, namely, let's call it uh, maybe M, I, J, um, and this is just the value of the kernel at the corresponding pairs. Right? Uh, so if, for any choice, this matrix, so I and J run from 1 to N, that's an N by N matrix, um, this matrix is uh, positive definite. Well, let's say it's semi definite. Could have zero eigenvalues. Right? So it's, 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 po- it's a positive matrix in the sense that we talked about all the time. Right? So, whenever you find such a positive kernel, you can make a Hilbert space. And this Hilbert space that you get from that is basically uniquely defined, and that is that is the message of this section. So let's let's state the theorem. Um, so let let us call this the Kolmogorov foundation. So for every positive definite kernel, Um, this K 
scalar product of two such vectors is just the curve. So, well, uh, let me just finish writing the theorem, moreover. If uh, well, let's if, if the span of the, the linear span that would be of V of X is dense. H is essentially uniquely defined. I have to say what I mean by this uniqueness, right? Because, uh, well, when are two Hilbert spaces the same? Well, actually, if they are isomorphic. So this, by this I mean, so if, if H, if H and, uh, let's say, H prime, V, V prime, are as described, special vectors that must exist there are also mapped into each other. Now, why are this? So, so I, this is what I meant by essentially uniquely defined. Um, so, it is, you could say it's uniquely defined up to the obvious ambiguity that you would have anyway, right? So, if you have, if you have some such space H, we call that the dilation space, right? So, if you have such, some such space H, and you map it unitarily to something else, obviously, and, and the vectors are also mapped into each other, then obviously the same things are true about this other space, right? The, the unitary image would serve exactly the same purpose and would clearly also satisfy the theorem. So this is the sort of obvious uh, isomorphism that you could have in this situation. And that's what I mean by essentially uniquely defined. Right? So it's Maybe you could drop it essentially uniquely defined here. It's up to the obvious isomorphism. Okay, so, so a little bit of terminology. If you have any collection of vectors in a Hilbert space, then this matrix, uh, so, so one, one condition here is that actually a one, one statement here, or one, one thing that we should, should keep in mind is, that if you have any collection of vectors, call them V of X, and now the, the set X would just be the set of labels for these vectors. Huh? So you have any collection of vectors, then the scalar products will be a positive definite matrix always. Right? So this will be a positive definite kernel. Why is that the case? Let's just check what it's So actually, the, the, this matrix of, of this kernel um, of scalar products is also known as the Gram matrix. So for, for any collection of vectors, Finite collection of vectors, so um, so we have we have to look at the positivity 
of this thing. But that means that the scale, that the any diagonal matrix element of this of this matrix is positive. So if we sum with C i bar and C j, that's the general uh, diagonal matrix element of this matrix. Now sums run from one to n. Now then we can use the linearity in the Hilbert space to say that this is the scalar product of the sum i c i b of x i, and the same thing here. So this is a norm square. That's positive definite. So the positivity of the scalar product of the norm in the Hilbert space um, exactly guarantees that any such matrix is a positive definite kernel. And this, the Kolmogorov dilation theorem says that every positive definite kernel is of that form. Right? Um, construction will actually be quite easy. Um, but let's, let's uh, one possible. Um, application here is, suppose you're, you're looking for a geometrical figure and you specify, let's say, um, you have uh, some, maybe some points on a sphere in, and, and you specify the angles between these, between these directions. Question, can you realize this configuration of angles? Right? Could this, is this a possible uh, set of angles between unit vectors, for example? Or, there doesn't even have to be unit vectors here. But this is a possible question. So, so for example, if you have a triangle, you have equal angles uh, of 120 degrees between, between three vectors. Yes, you can do that, right? Um, uh, because, you know, you, this, is a, this is an equilateral triangle, and you can do it in two dimensions. So, uh, so if you have a more complicated set of angles that you specify for yourself, for example, everything a little bit larger than 120 degrees. Can I do that? Uh, well, you, you would stick it in, check the positive definiteness of this matrix, and you would know. What you also get is a, an essentially unique Hilbert space, and in particular, the dimension of that space is unique, so you also get the information that you could do this in 17 dimensions, or something like that, because this is the dimension of the relation space, the relation space, and then... Uh, that, that's exactly how many dimensions you need. And any figure that you build in this way will have that number of dimensions. That's the uniqueness statement that you get. Okay, so, um, so how does the construction go? That's very easy, right? Because if I know the... Um, so, uh, proof of construction... So basically, I have a bunch of vectors of which I know the scalar products. The mutual, for every pair, I know the scalar product. That's what the kernel specifies for us. So what can I compute from that? Um, so take, uh, let's say, H twill as, uh, now there are different ways of saying that. I'll, I'll give, uh, give you the different terminologies. So the set, let's say, um, the set of formal linear combinations of uh, elements of X. So I allow, I allow, I, I pretend that the X's are elements of a vector space, and I allow, my, I allow myself to to multiply them with coefficients and to add this, these things up, finite sums. Right? I can always do that. Now, one, another way to say that is the fancy language here is the free vector space. Or maybe I should say, maybe say the C vector space over X. That's just a name for it. And you could also say this is the set of functions uh, 
let's say, um, gamma from x to c such that gamma of x is 0 except for finitely many x. So this, this is maybe a, a, a little slightly formal way of doing it that if you're not if you're not comfortable with that kind of maybe loose sounding talk, stick to this one. What what does this do? So uh, so this will the, the value of gamma will be the coefficient of the corresponding element x, and if there are only finitely many non-zero values, then actually the uh, the sum uh, gamma of x, x, so, so to speak, that, that is the vector that you're looking at, right? So these would be the coefficients, and, um, and then it's clear that if you, if, you have, if you have two such functions, and you add them as functions on x, then you just get the corresponding coefficients of the sum of vectors. Huh? So basically, this is a, that's a very simple construction, it's a vector space that um, contains x-like elements, and uh, it's, it's a vector space over C, and now the kernel gives that thing um, a scalar problem. Now define, let's say, gamma 1 and gamma 2. Let's, I, I'll just take this last one, let's say. Right? Um, so I have two such finite, finitely supported functions, gamma 1, gamma 2. And I simply write the sum over x uh, and y, uh, gamma 1 of x bar, gamma, uh, let, let me, maybe I put the channel in here, maybe x and y, uh, sorry, x, yeah, that's right, gamma 2. Now this defines, since it's just began, now this expression defines uh, uh, let me put scalar product on, on this space H12. Right? So I'm basically saying that I'm just doing the linear extension of the scalar product. I, I've given some values of the scalar product, and I'll, I'll say, okay, for these vectors I know what the scalar product is, and then I also know it for all linear combinations, because the scalar product is linear. That's all I'm saying. Right? So, uh, so now we have a scalar product which, which has the following properties. So first of all, if I look at this, uh, this is certainly true. So the positivity of the scalar product, which is part of the definition of a Hilbert space later, um, is, is true simply by the positive definiteness of the kernel. That's exactly the same as the positive, positive definiteness of the kernel. Right? Um, and of course, the, the sesquilinearity, I mean, the linearity properties are also correct, obviously, and it's defined in that way, right? so there's nothing wrong with that. But Uh, one thing is not true, um, that if the norm square of a vector is zero, we cannot conclude that gamma is zero. So actually, if you think of a Gram matrix, uh, and the sum of the vectors that you threw in there are linearly, in, linearly dependent, and this could happen, right? I, I just pick some linearly dependent vectors from a Hilbert space, and I make a ground matrix out of that, then clearly there are linear combinations that have zero norm, that actually are zero in the Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. right? so, um, so, but, but their coefficients are not zero. Uh, that means as an element of this space H twiddle, they're not zero. That would just mean that the coefficients are all zero. It's the only zero element in H twiddle, but it would still have zero norm. Uh, sorry, what about that? Yeah, okay, that's correct. And so this would be an example of a vector, of a linear combination of vectors, 
in such a space uh, so that we have zero norm squared, but the element is not zero. Right? Um, um, uh, also, usually false. Uh, is the conditionless part. So, for example, think of a, an orthonormal basis um, in, in the Hilbert space as your set of vectors. Right? So, the, the, the kernel is just delta ij, or delta xy. Okay. So, um, that's a perfectly good positive definite kernel. But the finite linear combinations of elements of basis vectors do not form a Hilbert space because I have convergent sums. And of course, they have to be in the Hilbert space as well. Right? So it's clear that in general, this, this part is OK. And these two other things that are typically, well, not typically, that are part of the definition of a Hilbert space are wrong in general. Right? But still, you call this, uh, so H twiddle. <coughs> with this scalar product is a pre-Hilbert space. That's sometimes, that's a kind of standard ter terminology for that. Right? Uh, and and pre-Hilbert space, of course, means that this thing wants to become a Hilbert space soon. And we have to do that. Right? Now, You've, in, the, in the literature, you find different ways of doing the construction. One is to solve first this problem. Right? And then we, you would check that, that's one way of doing it, you check that the set of vectors with zero norm form a subspace. And uh, then you, you take the quotient of the space H twiddle by the vectors of zero norm. And then you have solved this problem. Because then in this quotient, by definition, something that has zero norm is defined as a zero element. That's taking the quotient of Hilbert space, of a vector space. And then you go and do a completion construction. Now, my favorite way of doing it is to just do the completion construction because that will automatically take care of the other bit as well. And so let's have a look at how this works. So who of you has heard about the completion of a normed space to, to get a Banach space. Uh, have you? No? Okay, so let, I, I'll walk you through this, this construction, roughly at least. Um, and again, it's a little bit similar to this, to this basic idea of making a Hilbert space. You know some things about this Hilbert space, you know the norms. But the, the limits are missing. Some of the limits may be missing. So, so the idea is to throw in all converged sequences and define their limits as the new elements of, a, of a, an extended space. And you have to take care to see when two limits are the same. Now, these are things that you can define without actually having the limits already. Right? So... so uh, so let me, let me just say first, a uh, completeness construction, a uh, completion, construction takes care of both problems. And, and then now let's do that. So um, let's say, uh, I don't have a good letter for that, that's just like Cauchy. Huh? So Cauchy of H twiddle uh, is the set of Cauchy sequences.
So that means that I have gamma uh, 1, gamma 2, and so on, well, and so on, right? the infinite sequences. And they have the property that they satisfy the Cauchy convergence criteria. That is something that I, that I can say completely within the language of H. Twiddle and its norm. Of course, I do write uh, this thing as norm gamma squared. Right? Um, so, so these are sequences so that for all epsilon, there is uh, an n of epsilon, so that if for all n, n larger than n of epsilon, we have that the norm of gamma n minus the norm of gamma n is less than epsilon. Right? So that's, that's, that's your first year definition of a Cauchy sequence, with the only you probably heard about that in terms of numbers, but if you just put the double, the double strokes here instead of the single stroke, you have the definition of a Cauchy sequence in a normed vector space, where the normed vector space doesn't have to complete, have to be complete. Now, it's, it's clear why I'm doing that, because in the end, every Cauchy sequence is supposed to converge. That's a definition of... Um, of completeness. So the, the, the strategy is to say, well, okay, our space will be the set of Cauchy sequences, but of course that is way over parameterized. Right? So this is not the Hilbert space already, because of course if I change such a sequence in finitely many places, I get the same limit. This should be the same element. So there is a very simple way of saying that two sequences are converging to the same uh, value. So, so we have an equivalence relation. Which is basically supposed to mean they are going to the same limit. And in the Hilbert space, if the space is already complete, it should be exactly that condition. Right? So, um, so we have, I have two such Cauchy, Cauchy sequences, gamma and gamma prime, in Cauchy. Then I say that gamma is equivalent to gamma prime, if and only if the limit of gamma n minus gamma prime n is zero. So that means that they go to the same value, right? So if you if you think of this in a in a complete space, the way you used, you're probably used to, this is just saying that they have the same limit, right? So you have two convergent Cauchy criterion means that they are convergent, and this means that they are converging to the same thing. But I can use that as an equivalence relation on Cauchy sequences to define the the, the space and such. Okay, so. Um, So we define um, H, the Hilbert space of the from graph construction, is going to be uh, Cauchy of H twiddle modded out by this equivalence relation. That is, we call two elements the same if they have the same limit in that. Right? In, in words, I would say gamma and gamma prime have the same limit. So I take the set of Cauchy sequences, um, and well, this is the set of limits of Cauchy sequences, and that is the, your completion. Okay. So, so then V of X um, is would be an element in here, so this will be the class of the constant sequence. And 
Well, now if if I take the if I take the say it again. <laughs> if I take the third time. If I, <laughs> Fourth time now, if I take the scalar product of two such sequences, it will also converge, right? That's, that's part of the, if you take the scalar products between Cauchy sequences, um, then you can show that this is again a Cauchy sequence. Use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, basically. And this will, be, will, this will make clear that, uh, that the scalar products will also converge. So actually, uh, the scalar product, let's say, of the class of gamma and the class of, let's say, gamma prime, right, is just defined as the limit of the scalar products. Uh, gamma, what is it now? Gamma, gamma, gamma prime, gamma n. And you will have to show that this converges. Right? That, that's a simple exercise in terms of the Schwarz inequality. Right? So, so this also converges. And that defines your scalar product, and it's independent of the Cauchy sequence. That is, if I put equivalent things here, I get the same value. So it's actually defined on the quotient. And so we actually have um, a new space, a new vector space with, um, with a scalar product. Now we have to show that this is complete, so that it's actually Hilbert space. Now this is work that others have done for us. Right? So this is a general property of the completion construction. Um, so the most general version of the completion construction that is, that is easily used is in terms of uniform spaces, <coughs> and you find it in the topology book of Bourbaki. And there you show that quite generally, actually this is not just for sequences, but for nets. So this is, uh, so this is a general thing that you now have to if you now make Cauchy sequences in here, you have double sequences. Yes, you have sequences of sequences, and you have to show that this, this gives a proper convergence and everything. But okay, but that's I think we can safely leave that to Bulbaki and to the others who, who came up with this completion idea. Right? Uh, another subtlety here is that um, do we actually have a vector space? So, um, so what happens to the linear structure? And again, this, this automatically carries over. Uh, I can add, I can make linear combinations of sequences. This will also work for the constant sequences in the same way. And from this formula, it's also clear that you can, the linear combinations would come out properly uh, in the um, from scalar products, which then also means that, uh, well, every, everything matches up. So, so, okay, I'm not going to say this in any more detail, but this is the basic idea. Now, one thing that I, to, to point out is that I, I promised that the, 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 the problem that this is not a proper norm, but only a semi-norm, right? It, could have zero distance for dis distinct elements in H twiddle, that this is automatically solved here. Well, that's actually true because if I take the constant, if I take two, two linear combinations that are zero with respect to that norm, uh, uh, somewhere, where is the norm actually? It's up there, yeah. So I take two, two linear combinations, uh, or take one linear combination that is zero uh, with respect to the norm. For example, two elements that have that just happen to be labeled differently but are actually the same in the Hilbert space or something. Then, um, then take the constant sequence for that, and you see that the norm of the, so this will give an element of the, the corresponding linear combination in H, and if you compute the norm, you would just get zero. Right? So that is two, two se different sequences that have zero norm distance, or two, two different elements that have zero norm distance. They correspond to constant sequences in the space of Cauchy sequences. But they are just not just, the, the norm difference is not just converging to zero, it's just identically zero. So 
they get identified to the same element in the completion. So the completion automatically takes care of this other problem also. So it's actually, it's actually simpler to do it that way. Okay, so let's look at that theorem here. Ah, the minimality, the minimality. I didn't comment on that, right? So this, is, this will be part of all the dilation theorems that we prove. And it always works in the same way. So I'm, I'm constructing a Hilbert space which contains these vectors V of x. And I know their scalar product. So the, on the span of these vectors, all the scalar products are fixed. Right? There's nothing much I can choose there. But if the Hilbert space is actually a little bit larger than that, the information that I'm putting in about, the, about this Hilbert space will tell me nothing about the scalar product somewhere else. Right? So if I have a second summand uh, on this, to this Hilbert space, which I could always have that. Right? Could have a larger, if, I, if I don't have this minimality condition, so if the span of the Vx is not dense, but there is another subspace in that Hilbert space um, that contains no Vs, a closed subspace that contains no Vs, I can say nothing about that thing. And how could I? There's nothing there that would tell me anything. So, therefore, that part is pretty much arbitrary, but restricted to the span of the Vs, all the scalar products are fixed, and I can simply take this as the definition of the unitary operator. I have to check that this extends to a linear operator, and uh, that this is going to be unitary, and actually, surprise, surprise, the inverse will take V prime to V, and have the same construction in the other direction. Both are minimal, and therefore that, that gives it a uniqueness space. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's let's do an application. This is the nine mark dilation. Sometime in the 30s or 40s or so. So Neymark was the teacher of Alexander Hollywood, well, who's now the yeah. So, okay, so, um, so the idea here is, so I, I, we introduced um, observables as positive operator-valued measures. Right? And actually the, the theorem works for uh, positive operator-valued measures, but let's just stick to finite observables to... to because that's the stuff that I introduced. So we have these, these observables where each outcome is associated not with necessarily with a projection, but with a positive operator, and they all add up to one. Now the Neimark dilation says that if you, if you look at this in a, larger, in a suitable larger Hilbert space, you can actually think of this as projection valued. Only the states that you're using are not testing that part of the, Hilbert, the, the full Hilbert space. Right? So, um, so let's say, let's do the following. So let, let um, F be an observable. With a finite outcome space, let's say A. That is, we have for all A, we have a positive operator, and uh, the sum of the FAs is 1. Right? So th this was our definition of an observer. Uh, now, the Neimark dilation tells us, well, we can think of this as projection valued, with the following, the following way, then, Well, and F, so th these would be elements of, let's say, B of H, right? 
So that's, I just gave a name to the system Hilbert space, call it H. And uh, that there is a Hilbert space. H hat. Um, an isometry. V from H to H hat. And uh, orthogonal projections. So that is now a PVM, a projection valued measurement uh, and orthogonal projections for the EA on H hat. Well, actually, uh, we also want this to be an observable, so the sum is going to be one as well, such that FA is V star EA V. Now, another way to, to, to say that is that H hat is a larger Hilbert space. Why, why do I call that a larger Hilbert space? Well, the, the, this, this V is supposed to be an isometry, right? So it, it preserves, it takes the Hilbert space H and identifies it with a subspace of H hat, right? So there's a so, and, and, but there's more to H hat. So, um, okay. So, so this is this is in some sense a larger Hilbert space. And if I have a state preparation in H, this would also then look like a state that has support in the subspace V of H, right? So this the subspace in H hat. And if I take states like that, then I get exactly the same probabilities I, as I had before. But the, for, for, the, for this extended observable, yeah. But um, um, so, so E gives the same probabilities as F on these states that I get by embedding them into the larger Hilbert space. So, um, okay. So uh, I should I should follow the pattern here and also give you the uniqueness statement. Right? Um, so H H hat V and uh, what else? H hat and v, v and E right? um, are unique if the span of the vectors E A V phi and there's more closure of that is equal to H hat. So if I can get all the vectors in H hat by operating on these on the smaller Hilbert space with uh, with the projections E, right? And unique is is this essentially unique? It's unique in the obvious sense, right? If I have a unitary transformation of the H hat so that it connects the V and the V prime uh, and maps the E to the other E, then I get all everything remains the same. Right? So I'm just basically renaming elements. So that's the sort of natural uniqueness that you can spell out um, that is meant here. And it's, of course, this is, this is a child of the mother of all dilations. Um, and and we'll, we'll just reduce it to the, uh, the Neimark dilation to the Kolmogorov dilation. So let me erase it.
so let me just remark here. I, I said that, right? Uh, so H hat is larger than an isomorphic copy of H, right? So this whole thing is uh, so slogan here is. to the larger Hilbert space. And uh, John Smoling, one of the people in quantum information, actually said it going to the church of the larger Hilbert space. And when I had my 60th birthday, I got a doctoral hat with funny stuff on top. And they have actually built the church of the larger Hilbert space, which had a church tower that you could sort of pull up from large. <laughs> Very nice. It's in my office. You can, I can show you. So, so going to the church of the larger Hilbert space is this basic philosophy of dilating things to make them simpler. Right? Projection valued measures are uh, simpler than, than general POVMs. And for many questions that you may ask, um, this is a useful step to do. Okay, so and actually we'll have a, we'll prove some corollaries of that about P of E N. Okay, so how do I do it? Well, this actually gives you the hint. Huh? So the proof so we make a Kolmogorov uh, type dilation, and our set X on which this kernel lives, th those would be the labels of the vectors of which we know the scalar products already. This will be just the set A across the original Hilbert space. So this is the space of pairs, right? And, uh, and uh, the scalar product, so the kernel of, well, a pair consisting of A phi and B psi would be then the scalar product in H hat, that is the Kolmogorov space then, and I naturally I call this V of A phi and V of B psi. Right? So this, this is the dilation equation that tells you that, yes, you get the right scalar product, but what am I going to write for this? Now, the vectors that I will be talking about when I do that, when I've made the dilation, will be these. And if I take the, if I take two such vectors of this kind, they are labeled by an a and a phi. And the scalar product of two such vectors, well, let me just write it. This is supposed to be um, e a v phi e b v psi. This is, well, I should put this in, in parenthesis now, because that's where I want to go. Right? These will be the vectors uh, that we want to construct, but we don't have all these objects yet. We want to do the construction of course. But this tells us what the scalar product should be, because for that I, we can compute, uh, now this is a PVM, a projection valued measure, so if I have different A, B, they, uh, they will be, this will be zero. So what this will be is a delta AB times V phi FA V psi. And we can still, under, under the parenthesis, let's continue this, con uh, this calculation. This is phi V star FAV. Right? Put the V star over. And that's, so that gives us the F, uh, sorry, this is an E, right? This is an E, of course. And, but this, so this is uh, delta AB. Um, phi B e star E A B psi. But we want this to be the F. So end of funny parenthesis, this is what we take as a definition, delta AB. Okay. 
So now what we've arrived at is we, we, the given object is this PVM, P, P OVM, right? this positive operator that, that belong to the observable. And from that, we build a kernel. And the kernel is built in such a way that if the dilation equation and this density and all that holds, then, then, I can com then I can compute what the scalar product should be. And that's what I take as a definition of the scalar product. Okay? That's very straightforward. We have more examples of this later, so this is why I'm outlining the strategy so explicitly. So what we have to do now... What we have to do is to show that this kernel is positive definite. Right? So, I have to show Once we have that, we will just apply the well, this is already the Kolmogorov formula there, right? So this, this is the way we want to build our H hat. H hat will be the dilation space and V will be uh, as in the Kolmogorov dilation. So, so let's, uh, so the, the, there's only one way this proof could continue, right? So we choose elements A i phi i. Right? So this is at i 1 to n. And we have to show that the resulting matrix is positive definite. Okay? Um, that I get from this definition of the kernel. Okay? So we have to look at the sum now with some coefficients, C i bar um, delta, well the sum is over i and j. Um, then you have delta a i a j and uh, Phi I F A I Phi J and uh, C J. This is something that we have to show to be positive. So, so this sum, it's uh, if you look at this delta function, it's useful to group in in the eyes. Um, or these, 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 these elements according to um, the value of A, right? So, um, so this can be grouped. Actually, um, let's just do that. This is the sum of the line A. And now I have restricted sums over I, where AI has to be A. And also the sum over J, where AJ has to be A. I can do that because if AI and AJ are different, I get a zero term anyway. Right? So I put it, give a label to the the value of A here, and um, then this is just FA, I can omit the delta functions, so as I have CI bar, um, phi I FA phi J <coughs> CJ. Right? Is that okay? So I, I just organize this sum. Uh, I group each sum into cases where, a, where the AIs are the same. Give that a name. And then only the diagonal groups interact with each other. Right? So this is the delta function here that, that takes care of that. Actually, this, the whole proof is a little bit more tricky for general operator value measures. So <laughs> the, the finite case makes that part actually relatively simple. 
so, um, so, but then I can, within each group, I can now do that. So I have a sum over A, and, uh, and and an expression like that, where phi A is the sum that we can read off here. Right? So this is the sum over, uh, let's say, J. Uh, C, J, phi, J, but J only taken with A, J equal to A. This is why this, this vector depends on A, right? This is by collection of terms where the first element is A. So this, this is a condition in that sum. Right, and then I, I have the sum twice. I have once here, I can just collect these vectors, and once here I can collect those vectors and do the sum, and that gives the same vector in each case. But now f is positive. Right? fa is supposed to be a positive operator. That is part of the definition. So this is positive. And thereby we've shown the positive definiteness of this kernel. And that's almost all. Right? So, so we know that uh, this is a, this h hat, and we have a function uh, from a cross h with h hat. Right? So this is the b of a and phi, and those are the scalar products that we have. Now we haven't quite constructed everything yet. First of all. Um, uh, we have to we have to define the projections, right? So um, so define um, E A is the projection uh, onto V of A phi. Now, it, it's clear from the definition that, that of course, if, if A is different from B, then V of A phi, uh, V of B phi, such vectors are orthogonal automatically because there is a delta function in the definition of the scalar product. Right? So these are clearly orthogonal spaces, and um, E A will be with the projection onto these spaces. Right? So actually, we have the equation that E A on one of these spanning vectors. So we, let, us, let us think of the minimal dilation, right? But these vectors V of A phi span the whole space, and uh, Sorry, uh, I define the projection to be delta a b b of a phi. Right? So this gives a well-defined projection. And um, what else? Oh yes, the, the the map v we have to define. So so v from h to h hat is going to be defined by v phi is the sum over a of v a phi. Um, there is a... Well, if you do that, then it's clear that all the scalar products work out, right? So this, this is... Uh, um, and... Well, what else? Yeah, there's one subtlety. I claim that V is supposed to be an isometry. Um, an isometry means it's a linear operator. Right? So, so why is phi linear? Why is V, uh, v linear? V linear of V of 
a phi linear in phi. Right? So I claim that these these dilate these, these Kolmogorov vectors v a phi, the way they are constructed, there is no intrinsic linearity in this in this picture. Right? So there could be anything if I have a general kernel. Um, I mean, X was uh, for, for the for the Kolmogorov dilation had no structure whatsoever. Certainly, no linear structure, and it's not. So it's not even clear that that these V of X vectors um, have some inclination to become linear. Right? Now, this of course this has to go back to our definition of the scalar product, and. Uh, but this is a general part of this of this whole construction. Now look at the expression that defines our scalar product. Right? Then this this is a bilinear or sesquilinear expression in phi and psi. And that automatically implies that the corresponding dilation map, the, the V map, has to be linear. Right? Because uh, so so uh, Need here uh, the expression for the kernel is bilinear. And that is already enough to give you that. Why is that the case? So, um, so you look at uh, some v of a uh, wait a minute. okay so 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 I want to show linearity so I can I can look at something like this I put a linear combination into this v operator I want to show that this is linear so what do I do I subtract the same thing with these coefficients pulled out. Right, so this is some vector, some linear combinations of v's. Right? We have one v here and n v's on that side. Right? So n plus one v terms. Um, okay, so call this vector phi. And then you just use the compute the norm squared of this vector. Now when you do that and you use the linearity of the expression for the kernel, right, then uh, you just get zero. Right? Is, that, is that clear? So I put in, the, the a would be just the same for all these terms anyway, right? so the, the, I'm just taking one a, but since this is linear in phi, the expression for the kernel will have this kind of linearity. And then implies that this vector has norm zero, which just means that this function v is linear. So things like that automatically come out because the kernel has a linearity property and that is transferred to the linearity of objects on the dilation side. Okay. Um, so So let's do a corollary. So A is actually a subset of R. This is the typical case when, uh, for, for if you take a projection value measure, that would just mean that I have a spectral measure. Right? And, and actually, uh, um, yeah, we, yes, just a subset, just a subset. Right? So I want to show uh, So first of all, you can you can show the um, 
I mean, a POVM, just like a PVM, gives you a probability distribution over these numbers uh, for every state. Right? And therefore, you could look at moments. So then uh, define A M. This is the Mth moment operator. So what does this do? Well, if I take the trace with a, with a density operator here, then I see that the expectation of the nth moment operator in any density operator is the nth moment of the corresponding probability distribution, because the probability distribution would be, so let me just write it out, trace row a n is the sum a, a to the power n trace row F A, and this is just the outcome distribution. So, so the expectation value of the nth moment operator gives you the uh, the nth moment of the out outcome distribution. objects, uh, that, that's not a correlation. My corollary is to say that if I take this difference, which looks a little bit like a variance, right? So this is second moment minus square of the first, where the square is formed like an operator. It's an operator square. So, so this, this, is, this is the variance operator in some sense. Now for a projection valued measurement, this is zero. Why? Um, well, anyway, then, let me say, okay. then this is positive. And that's the corollary. Okay? Now, this, this is interesting because it characterizes the amount of noise that is in a POVM in some sense. So, uh, so the remark. So, if if, uh, if a squared is f a. So, if we have projection value, then then uh, or let me let me rather say f a f b is delta a b f a. Then I can just compute that. Right? I get the sum over a square f a minus the sum over a and b a b um, f a f b right? I'm just writing out what the first moment is and square it and collect the coefficients right? so that's just sum a f a that's the first moment and sum b f b that's again the first moment so this is just this the square of the first moment operator. Now, if I have this equation and they are orthogonal, then this is equal to, and I just put that in, this delta AB FA, right? Then I get an A squared and an FA again, and so this, this vanishes. So for projections, this vanishes, and this justifies the formula that you learned in your quantum mechanics course for computing the variance, to take the square of the operator, right? So if you have a projection valued measure, of this sort with real outcomes, then the first moment operator determines everything because the higher moment operators are actually just the powers of this operator. Mm -hmm. right? So actually, so, so to generalize that, uh, you actually have that A to mth moment operator is just the first moment to the power n. And so, so what used to be the powers for the, for the PVM case, for the projection value case, will now be these moment operators. They're not equal to the, to the squares or to the powers of a single operator, but the difference is positive. That's a very useful inequality when you want to treat variances.
So let's do this. Use my mark. Uh, so we have uh, the violation space, and the asymmetry, and the E operators. Right. So, and then look at this difference. So this is A squared FA minus some AB. So using the dilation gives you here uh, something with F E, sorry, V E V star and another V E V star. And I artificially do the same thing here. So um, this is the sum over A B. Um, A B. So the first term, use that we have a projection valued measure in the dilation. So EA, EB is delta AB, and that gives you the A squared that we had before. Right? Um, so on, on, on the other term, I just copied by replacing FA to be this uh, dilation form, with the dilation formula, right? V star EA, B. So, this is equal to the sum over A and B, A B, B star, and then I can collect the two terms by writing 1 minus B B star in the middle. In the first term I would have the identity, and in the second I have a VB star, and that actually produces both of these terms. So V star V was the identity. This is a this is a isometry that that was part of the nine mark dilation. I didn't actually check that, but this is this is immediate to write down. Um, so so V V star is the identity, but now we are going to a larger Hilbert space. So V V star is actually the projection in H hat onto that subspace that is uh, spanned by the by the image of V. Right? So it, it, it would be a projection all, so that all its images would lie in VH and will be precisely the projection onto that subspace. Right? VV star um, is then always a projection and that's what this projection is. So this projection here is a projection to the orthogonal complement of the, of the image of the smaller Hilbert space in the larger Hilbert space, if you want some interpretation of it. But also, this whole expression is by, so, so it has, I can separate the A's and the B's in this expression. So this is equal to, um, well, uh, let, let's call this X star, uh, 1 minus V, B star, X, where X is equal to the sum over B, E, B, uh, B times E, B, B. Yeah, so there's a factor B here. And uh, I throw that in. And do the sum over B. And that's the sort of thing that I can collect together. So, um, so this is some operator. Well, actually, actually, it's an operator from H to H hat. But that doesn't really matter. Now, this, is, this operator is positive. It is, it's, it's actually a projection. And x star x always produces something positive out of something positive. So this whole operator is positive. OK, so this proves this, this variance inequality for P over Very typical dilation proof. 
I actually needed that for some reason. Right, the, the, René Schwanek and, and, and Lars and I are writing a paper at the moment over uh, about the numerical determination of optimal uncertainty relations in terms of variances. And there is one part about how to use these generalized measurements to detect entanglement. And then we needed this inequality. And so we actually tried to give an elementary proof somehow, or somewhere just starting from knowing that these operators are positive. Uh, right, you have the FA are positive. So from that, you should be able to prove that. Well, of course, you can, but um, actually, it always kind of amounts to this proof. So this is by far the easiest. When you know the, the, the Neimark theorem, this is kind of obvious. And, and higher moment inequalities go in a similar way. Um, they're not so straightforward, actually. But uh, this, this is a typical application of dilation theory. OK, so um, do, do I have an empty bar somewhere? We have 15 minutes, 13. So let me just begin with another important piece. Actually, this is, this is kind of the dilation theorem. Um, In some sense, this is a, a generalization of the Neymar. Um, and it is sort of the dilation theorem for channels. That in some, for, for the finite cases, it's basically the same as saying that you can expand into cross operators. <coughs> but this gives a more abstract view of, the, of this dilation business and also helps to do some things more generally. I mean, see more of the structure, actually. So we are kind of reproving something here. Uh, Steinspring's paper is from 55 or something like that, uh, way before any physicist thought of complete positivity. I have no idea why he did it. And it's also not clear from the paper, because it's a mathematical paper, appeared in the Proceedings of the Naval Academy of Sciences of the US. No, I have no clue what he had to do with the Navy or this theorem actually has to do with the Navy. Um, and being a mathematical paper, he doesn't do much about motivation. Right? So he just jumps right into it, and there it is. Right? Um, so, so this is an extremely useful theorem for, for all of the channel theory and some, definitely some of the basic, one of the really basic facts. So just to highlight that, um, one of the, the founders of this quantum information stuff, Arthur Eckert, uh, once, uh, so I was giving a talk at some conference years back, and I don't, I don't even exactly remember when, and Arthur was sitting in the, in the back of the, of the lecture hall with some, some of his students, and they were joking and making a bet how long it would take until I say Stein's. <laughs> and, and definitely I did in that talk, but maybe not in every talk, but it, it really comes up a lot. Right? So, so really this is one of the, the, really, uh, of the basic theorems, and I'll certainly not do this in 10 minutes, but I can give you a rough introduction. Right? So, so the idea is uh, characterizing channels. So 
So this would be CP maps from, let's say, B of uh, H out to B of H in. And actually, this is also a generalization of the Neumark dilation at the same time. So that actually, Neumark can be just obtained as a special case. But for that, I have to be a little bit more generally here. Uh, take a general C star algebra here. So if this is commutative, and if C star algebra is called an A, right? and this, if, it, if this is commutative, then the output is classical. Right? So this is the output observable algebra for a channel. And a classical output just means that I have an observable in the same sense as, uh, as there, only that now also the continuous cases, uh, not just this finite discrete output outcome set is taken, but an arbitrary one is allowed. Commutative just means uh, observable. And then uh, Neymar, in that case, Neymar is satisfied. And actually, so it, it's actually it, it's quite useful to have this in a more general, in this more general form. So I have a CP map from an algebra into some B of H, right? and uh, let's call this uh, T. And so uh, represent or write T as. So T of an element A. Now this would you can think of this as an operator in the output space, in the output uh, observable algebra, right? So B of H out. Um, this is written as V star. You see, do you see the similarity by V and uh, pi from A to H hat. Ah, B, B goes from H to H hat. Uh, it's now H D to H hat. And this is what is known as a star representation. And th this is the basic dilation formula. And there are various corollary, various parts of the Steinsberg theorem related to the minimality also um, that help with determining the uh, uh, well, we'll come to that, we'll come to that. Um, I think, yeah, well, okay, so, so you, but you see from this already how to do the construction. Because, um, so if, if that is supposed to be the dilation formula, then uh, this fixes the scalar products of the operators or of the of the elements, I don't know, of the of the vectors. Um, v of A and Phi. This looks uh, <laughs> especially when I take A for the algebra element now. Uh, this looks remarkably similar. This would be P of A and B phi. Right? Because, so, um, okay, so, so if, if, if I have such a formula, then there are certain vectors for which I can compute the scalar products right away in this, in this larger space, H hat, and that will actually be the relation space. The relation space will be generated by these guys. Minimality will mean that these vectors are total. I mean that their span is dense. Um, and let's let's, let's just uh, this. We have enough time for that. Let's just compute the scalar product of two such guys. Yeah? 
assuming this dilation formula, and uh, well, nothing else, right? What should it be? That's the scalar property. Phi of A, B phi, phi of B, B psi. And uh, this is so phi of A, I can start on the other side. This is V of phi, phi of A. I should write the star outside. But that's part of the definition of a star representation, that this is the same as writing pi a star. Well, then, then let's just leave it like that. And then a star for a star representation, this is actually pi of a star b. Representation just means that it's faithful also for the product. It's a homomorphism for the product. And therefore, I can collect these two terms together. It's very much like in the, in the Neumark, right? You see the same pattern here. Um, and then we have v psi. Now, but if we replace that like this, then this is just, and put the v star over, take the dilation formula, then this is phi t of a star b star. So I can, I can express the scalar product of these guys completely in terms of the given channel t. Now, what we have to check is that this kernel that we get this way is positive definite. Right? Same, same thing as before. We go back to the mother of all dilations, Kolmogorov's theorem. And uh, so we have to check the positive definiteness of this scalar product. I think that's too much for two minutes, but easy. Right? We'll do that. And it, it actually amounts exactly to the complete positivity of T. Right? So like for the for the... For all these dilation theorems, there is an easy part that says when I have something represented like this, it is automatically a completely positive channel. And uh, all completely cha uh, positive channels are, are like that. Right? That's, the other, that's the part that is the actual dilation theorem. And so, so we'll have to, we, I think we can, we can just start from here. Maybe I should say a few words about star representations when, when that becomes appropriate. Um, and that will be done next Wednesday, I think. Right? So tomorrow will be an exercise session. David is out of town, actually in Turku, in Finland. And um, so I'll do the exercise session. I mean, he's stepping in, to, substituting for me, so I'm substituting for him. Um, the, what's the typical format? Would you just meet here, right? Or in that other room? And... Uh, then, then we discuss that a little bit. Okay, great. So see you tomorrow at around noon.